Welcome to Tanakh Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live out of Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of the Rabbi Cross Examines the New Testament with Rabbi Michael the Manskowak. Welcome back, sir. How are you this lovely day? Baruch Hashem. Thank God to be here with you. Baruch Hashem. Let's Baruch be Hashem. back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> I'm totally, I still can't get over the title. I love the title that you picked today. Oh, man, it's going to be a great show. So thank you for tuning in. Be sure to go to out, Outreach. Now, blah, 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 yeah, blah, blah, blah. Juice for Judaism. Toy boat. Toy boat. <laughs> Juice for Judaism.ca. And, and that that is also how you will actually contact him if you want to send him an email. Just go there, hit the contact contact us page, and you have everything you need there. So um, so without without holding you up, Rabbi, Mark chapter 3, why didn't Jesus' own family believe in him? Okay. <clears throat> so one of the problems with choosing a title is that you're sort of zeroing in on uh, a small ch- section of the chapter. There's a lot more going on in the chapter. Sure. But <laughs> if I wanted a t- title that would cover everything, it would be a you know, two-page title. <laughs> so <laughs> it must be a meaty, meaty book, meaty letter this time. So <laughs> the funny. chapter begins with an uh, interesting story. Um, so it says that Jesus entered again into a synagogue, And there was a man there whose hand was withered. And they, it just says they were watching him to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Um, It doesn't say here, right on the spot, who the they is. But when you look at the parallel um, account of this story in Luke chapter 6, verse 7, so it just clarifies that the they here are the scribes and the Pharisees. So basically you have... Jesus coming into a synagogue, there's a, a congregant there, a person that's there who has a hand that's withered. And this obviously is taking place on the Sabbath. And so the, uh, the, there, there are a bunch of scribes and Pharisees who were watching. They were paying very careful attention to see if Jesus would heal this person on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And basically, Jesus says to the person with the withered hand, get up and come forward. And he essentially says at the end of the story, he says to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched out his hand and his hand was healed. His hand was restored. That's the the basic guts of the story. And the question is, and this is a very obvious question, would this have actually been prohibited on the Sabbath, meaning for Jesus to do what he did, was that a violation of the laws of the Sabbath? So clearly, there is absolutely no biblical prohibition uh, involved, even remotely, to heal anyone on the Sabbath. (laughs) You wouldn't imagine, just by, by imagining the biblical laws of the Sabbath, why it would be problematic to um, heal someone on the Sabbath. And that's even if you accept the oral law, meaning that the, the, the written text of the Torah simply says, do not do any melacha on the Sabbath. And that word melacha is very, very difficult to translate. It doesn't really have uh, parallel uses that would be helpful in defining here what is meant by not doing melacha on the Sabbath. So uh, normative Judaism, which believes is an oral Torah that was given not just alongside, but actually given prior to the written Torah, because we know that Moses was on Mount Sinai, who was receiving the oral Torah before the written Torah was even written down. In any event, according to the traditional Jewish point of view, in the oral Torah, there were 39 kinds of activity, sort of uh, categories of activity that were prohibited on the Sabbath, and none of them uh, is healing. Healing is not one of the activities that's prohibited either by simply reading the text of the Torah itself or by even looking at the oral Torah's uh, enumeration of the 39 categories of activity. Now, Rabbinic law, meaning the rabbis we know, were charged with essentially protecting 
the laws of the Torah, meaning that the laws of the Torah, if you can imagine it this way, it's like going into a subway and, you know, a, theoretically, a person could stand at the very, very, very edge of the platform, you know, to make sure they get a good seat on this on the subway train. But no municipality in the world really sort of encourages that or even allows that. They always paint a pretty wide yellow line to keep people back away from the very, very edge of the platform. And so essentially that's what the sages, that that's what the rabbis were charged to do. They were charged to make sure that people don't sort of get too close to violating the biblical law and fall into the track, so to speak. So just to give two quick examples, the, the Torah has many people with whom you're prohibited from having sexual intercourse. You're not allowed to have intercourse with certain people. You can't sleep with certain people. That's clear in the text of the Torah itself. But what about, you know, hugging and kissing them? What about secluding yourself in a locked room with them? That would not violate anything in the Torah itself. But the sages, the rabbis, were smart enough to realize that if you allow people to engage in hugging and kissing people that they're not supposed to be sleeping with, um, you know, we know what happens. I mean, human nature takes over. And so the sages made what is called a fence around the laws of the Torah and said, if you're not supposed to be sleeping with someone, don't seclude yourself in a locked room with them. Don't be involved in any kind of erotic physical contact with them, hugging, kissing, etc. Or another example would be that one of the 39 uh, prohibited activities on the Sabbath, according to the oral Torah, is writing. Right To, to write would be prohibited according to the oral Torah. But it, it would there'd be no prohibition against carrying around a pen or a pencil on the Sabbath. But the rabbis, the sages said, it's not a good idea because you're so used to just pulling out a pencil from your pocket during the week that if you have it there, you might just inadvertently pull it out and write on the Sabbath. So the sages said, as a rabbinic prohibition, they said, we would basically say, don't carry around things on the Sabbath that you're not supposed to use. So there is no biblical prohibition against healing. However, one of the 39 prohibited areas of activity is something called grinding. And it was essentially part of the process of producing bread, um, you would grind the wheat. And so grinding was one of the activities that's prohibited. And the concern was that since medications, medicines were usually produced by grinding spices or herbs or different plants, so the sages prohibited taking medication on the Sabbath because a person might come to grind the medication, to produce the medication through grinding, and that would be problematic, <clears throat> unless, of course, it's the exceptional case of saving someone's life. We know that when it comes to saving a life, you're certainly not just permitted to violate the Sabbath laws, you're required to violate the Sabbath laws. Um, and so the rabbis prohibited taking medication, giving medication, and actually all kinds of healing activities. The, the healing arts, so to speak, would not be practiced on the Sabbath. Of course, again, if someone's life is in danger, if there's a risk to life, then it certainly all bets are off. So the problem here is that <clears throat> in cases where there's danger to a limb, where someone's limb is basically not functioning properly. So there, the rabbinic prohibition was not in effect. So in a case like this, where a person had a withered arm, withered hand, um, there'd be no problem with prescribing medication because that rabbinic prohibition against giving medicines lest you come to grind them was not in effect when a person's limb was in danger. 
But there's a bigger problem here. The bigger problem is that what Jesus did was not considered healing at all, meaning that it wasn't considered a medical practice to say to someone, stretch out your hand, right? Come here and stretch out your hand. This would not be considered a healing activity whatsoever, and there'd be absolutely no biblical or rabbinic prohibition of doing what Jesus did. So the entire story is a, a bit bizarre because you have these scribes and Pharisees, um, you know, basically monitoring an activity as if it would be prohibited, where there was absolutely no prohibition in this story whatsoever. Now, <clears throat> the bigger problem here, I think, is that just uh, the bigger problem for Christianity, not for this text, is that traditional normative historical Christianity insists that Jesus was not just claiming to be the Messiah, he was claiming to be God in the flesh, and that he basically was inviting or even insisting that his followers worship him, and they insist that that's actually what happened, that the followers of Jesus did devote themselves to worshiping him. So the reality is that if, if this indeed was the case, if Jesus was claiming to be God and was being worshiped as God by his disciples, which is a clear, unambiguous biblical prohibition of idolatry, so why would anyone trying to get the goods on Jesus have to sneak around trying to catch him breaking a rabbinic prohibition like healing on the Sabbath, especially in our case where there was no prohibition anyway? But it makes the whole story sound very peculiar. And to me, it would be, again, part of the evidence that I believe Jesus never claimed to be God, his disciples we're not worshiping him as God, because if that were the case, th this whole story in Mark chapter three would be ridiculous. Um, you know, they, they wouldn't have to be snooping around to try and catch him breaking a rabbinic law where he'd be literally breaking just about the worst biblical prohibition that exists. I just wanted to make one other point here, and this often goes unnoticed, very interestingly, unnoticed by readers of the Greek scriptures. And you'll find this observation, I, I saw it first in a wonderful book that I really recommend strongly by Chaim Maccabi called Revolution in Judea. He's really better known for his work called The Mythmaker, where he discusses Paul, but he has an earlier book where he discusses not Paul, but the gospels. And this book, again, is called The Revolution in Judea. And he makes a very, I think, um, important observation. He says that the Gospels give a very, very distorted um, view of what the history was back then, at that time. He says, imagine, for example, that you're reading a history of Vietnam. I mean, I grew up in the 60s when, you know, this was the hottest issue in North America, in, in America. Um, but imagine you're reading a history of Vietnam and the history basically make, makes no mention of the American troops that were stationed in South Vietnam and, and what was going on at that time, you know, in the country. Um, it would be impossible. You could not imagine a history of Vietnam without, I mean, for, for people living in South Vietnam, it would have been the most um, sort of obvious disruption of their life um, to have the presence of those American troops there all the time and all of the, um, you know, sabotage that was going on and the infiltration by the Viet Cong and the fighting that was going on. It, it was it was the most significant reality for people living in Vietnam at that time. And yet you couldn't imagine the possibility of any treatment of the history of that period of time just 
ignoring, <laughs> not mentioning the presence of American troops there. And Maccabi says that when you read the Gospels, you get the impression that Judea, the land of Israel, basically is a nice, peaceful place. Um, you know, not much going on there. And the biggest problem seems to be all of those miserable scribes and Pharisees that are running around giving Jesus a hard time. But what you don't see in the Gospels is the, the biggest reality that would have been right in the faces of anyone living at that time, which was the brutal Roman occupation. You know, we use the word occupation now and it brings up horrible images. The Romans were brutal occupiers. Their presence was all over the place. They didn't only crucify, you know, a Jesus. The estimation was they crucified about 100,000 Jews and crucifixion was not the normal way of putting people to death. You know, you didn't get crucified for double parking your camel. It was reserved. It was a penalty reserved for people that were threatening the Roman occupation, meaning anyone that was instigating some kind of rebellion or fomenting rebellion or plotting against the Romans, any time the Romans felt that their rule was being threatened or challenged, they would put a person on the cross just to make an example of them. Don't start up with us. And so walking around and seeing people impaled on the cross um, was just an everyday sight. Roman troops all over the place. Um, there wasn't freedom for the people in Israel. They were incredibly heavily taxed. And, um, you know, the Romans imposed many restrictions on the Jewish people. It was terrible. But you don't get that impression from reading the Gospels. It seems like, you know, Judea is a wonderful, sweet, nice place to live. Everything is nice and rosy, great place to vacation, you know, except that these miserable rabbis are running around and just making life miserable for Jesus and his followers. That's the only conflict that you see in the Gospels, and it's a very significant problem. So here, chapter three begins with one of these stories where you have these scribes and Pharisees sort of sneaking around the synagogue trying to catch Jesus doing something wrong. Um, very, very difficult story on many levels. And in verse six, uh, Mark says that, or whoever wrote Mark, I just wanna make that clear that the, the document is not signed Mark. Um, it's just a tradition of the church that it was compiled by Mark. In any event, we'll, we'll say Mark for convenience sake. Um, in verse six says that the Pharisees were so shocked by what Jesus did in healing the man with the withered hand that they consulted with the Herodians about how they might destroy him. So this entire incident, when you read it, really lacks any sense of authenticity. It really does not have the ring of truth to it. First of all, going back two verses, Jesus asks the Pharisees, because he sees that they're sort of looking to catch him. And in verse four, Jesus asks the Pharisees if it was lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to kill. But it says they kept silent. They didn't say anything. Now, why is that? His question to them was not too difficult. It was easy to answer. And it's interesting that there are a number of places in the Gospels where Jesus challenges the um, sages, the Pharisees, with relatively goofy questions that are easily answered by a young student, and yet the rabbis seem to not be able to answer him. It, again, it doesn't ring true. Any, you know, self-respecting Pharisee, any normal Jew back then would have been able to easily answer his questions. So is it lawful to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to kill? These are not true questions. It's not really understandable why the Pharisees would have remained silent. It seems to me that it's a literary device used by the writer of Mark to make them look bad or to make them look stupid or to make them look like they were hypocrites. But it doesn't ring true 
in terms of what probably would have happened. And then the reality is that they would not have been shocked by what Jesus did here. He didn't do anything wrong. To say to someone who has a withered hand, stretch forth your hand, let me see your hand, is absolutely zero wrong with that, either according to biblical law or rabbinic law, no problem at all. You know, it's not as if, for example, he put medicine on the person's arm, he rubbed ointment onto the arm, and maybe they would have questioned, is it okay to, to apply the medicine in this case, right? I mean, that might have been a question that was raised, is it okay to apply the medicine here? And the answer would have been yes, because again, if there wasn't a danger to the limb, it would have been problematic. But again, in a case where the person has a limb that's not functioning properly, you could apply medicine, but he didn't even do that. He didn't give the man any medicine, apply any medication. Um, so what he did, there was absolutely zero problem. It would not have shocked any of the Pharisees. And number three, if they really had a problem with what he was doing, if for some reason they really had a problem with what he was doing, they wouldn't have gone to the Herodians. The Herodians, you know, were basically the government of Herod, Herod the Great, who was a tremendous enemy of the Pharisees. So if they were really bothered by what Jesus was doing here, they would have gone to the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish Supreme Court, and that would have been where they would have pressed their case against Jesus. They would not have gone to the Herodians. So the whole story here just doesn't read um, with, uh, it doesn't pass the smell test of authenticity. Now, in verses seven through 10, uh, you have basically something that we discussed last week, which is that you have here another passage where it describes the incredible uh, popularity of Jesus. Let's just read it again quickly. It says that Jesus withdrew to the sea, uh, to the sea with his disciples, and a great multitude from the Galilee followed, and also from Judea and from Jerusalem and from Idumea and beyond the Jordan and the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon. A great number of people heard of all that he was doing and came to him, and he told his disciples that a boat should stand ready for him because of the crowd so that they would not crowd him. For he had healed many with the result that all of those who had afflictions pressed around him in order to touch him. So you have here a description of the immense popularity of Jesus. Again, the crowds that are coming to him. You see the same thing described in this chapter in verse 20 also. It mentions um, the crowds coming and gathering around him to such an extent that he couldn't even eat a meal. I mean, this is, again, an ongoing description throughout the Gospels about how popular Jesus is. And what I mentioned last week, and I just want to expand on it a little bit now, is that this totally contradicts what Christians try to read into the suffering servant passage in Isaiah chapter 53, where Isaiah says about the servant that the servant was despised and rejected of men, despised and rejected of men. And th the question is this. So I'll ask two questions. Number one, again, the Christians insist that this is describing Jesus the Messiah. I would ask the question, how many times does the Tanakh tell us that the Messiah would be despised and rejected? How many times does that, do we hear that in the Tanakh? And the answer would be zero, except, except if you were to be able to prove that Isaiah 53 um, is describing the Messiah. If you could prove it, then perhaps Isaiah 53 might be describing the Messiah as despised and rejected, but that would be the only time in the entire Tanakh, traditional Jewish understanding, because again, Isaiah repeatedly identifies the servant of the Lord as the people of Israel. So if you were to ask the question, how often does the Tanakh say that the people of Israel 
would be despised and rejected. It's literally many, 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 many times throughout the Tanakh, not just in Isaiah, in many, many of the books of the prophets, Israel is described as being universally despised and rejected. That's in terms of how the Messiah is described in scripture. But then let's go to the videotape and ask ourselves, well, does this describe Jesus? Was Jesus despised and rejected? So if you take the gospel seriously, they paint a picture of someone who is incredibly popular during his lifetime, incredibly popular. And the worst that you have are these small groups of Pharisees and scribes that seem to not like him. And at the end of his life, maybe a courtyard full of people who were seem to be allegedly clamoring for his death. But it, it's it's short lived. You know, it's not as if for his whole life he's despised and rejected by huge numbers of people. The on balance, he is someone who is presented as immensely popular. This is in the words of the Gospels. And then if you take Jesus after his death, he basically is the most popular human being in the history of the world. You don't get more popular than Jesus. So it's very hard to plug Jesus into Isaiah 53 when Isaiah insists that the servant of the Lord will be despised and rejected of men not just for a few minutes. It means that this is going to be his um, history, his legacy. It's going to be who he is. His whole life is a life of rejection and just being despised. It does not describe Jesus, but it does describe the history of the Jewish people who have been despised and rejected throughout their history. And no matter where we live, and even in countries where there are no Jews, Jews are despised and rejected. Um, just a little bit of research today will prove that. You go to countries today where there are no Jews, like in the Far East, in Malaysia, all the conspiracy theories about Jews controlling the world, you don't have massive numbers of Jews living in Japan. And yet you have all these books there about how Jews are controlling the world. Malaysia, not a place where you have much of a Jewish community, if any, and there massive amounts of anti-Semitism. The Jews are, again, uh, you know, tools of the devil trying to control the world. Very, very difficult to square Jesus with the chapter in Isaiah about the suffering servant. Um, in verses 11 and 12, so we're told that whenever the unclean spirits beheld him, they would fall down before him and they would cry out saying, you are the son of God. And he earnestly warned them not to make him known. Now, I don't think these are stories. I mean, again, I want to just make it clear. I do not accept any of the Gospels uncritically as being historically accurate. Um, you know, I think that if there's a story which doesn't violate our sense of history, it might be very possible that it did happen. But I just I want to make it clear because I've been seeing a lot of strange things on social media lately. I saw someone yesterday claiming that I'm a follower of Jesus. So um, I do not, because I'm reading these passages, I do not uncritically accept them as historically uh, accurate. Um, I don't necessarily reject all of them. It could be that some of these stories did happen, but I just want to make that clear. Let's put it out there. So it says here that whenever the unclean spirits beheld him, They'd fall down before him and cry out, saying, you are the son of God. And he earnestly warned them not to make him known. So I don't think a story like this is describing disembodied unclean spirits or demons. I think if you go back to chapter one of Mark in verses 23 and 24, it's really describing some kind of possession, demon possession, where someone is that someone has unclean spirits that have taken them over. And so I think that's what it's speaking about here in verses 10, 11 and 12, that whenever such a person would encounter Jesus, the person speaking, I guess, through the possession of this demon or the unclean spirits would um, call out that you are the son of God. 
Um, and it's interesting that Jesus warns them. Now, again, it's not clear here if this means he warns these people who are possessed or he, warn, he warns the, um, the unclean spirits. It's not really 100% clear, but it's interesting that he warns them not to make him known. And this is interesting. Jesus always seems to be doing this. He always seems to be telling people not to blab about what they experienced. Many stories where he performs alleged miracles or healings, he tells people to put it in the vault and not tell anyone about it. Or when he would tell people, for example, um, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 16, right? Don't tell anybody who I am. Or in Matthew chapter 16, verse 20, don't tell anyone that I'm the Messiah. There seems to be this conspiracy of silence that he imposes on the people he interacts with. Just, I don't want word getting out that I'm doing these miracles and I'm doing these healings, that I'm the Messiah. Just let's keep it between ourselves. And it's not really clear why he's imposed this veil of secrecy. Um, I've seen some very, very speculative Christian commentaries um, that try to come up with a reason. They don't really seem to me compelling. Once, for example, um, and I believe it was the New American Standard Study Bible says that he was nervous that the people would try to impose their erroneous understanding of what the Messiah is supposed to be upon him, meaning that people according to this commentary, had the erroneous view, this actually happens to be the correct view, that the Messiah was supposed to liberate Israel from the Roman oppression, and that he was telling everyone to keep things on the QT because he didn't want massive crowds to sort of um, impose their view of what he should be doing as the Messiah upon him. I think there's a much simpler explanation I'm not, I'm not convinced I'm right, but I think that he knew very well what would happen if the Roman authorities heard about someone who was claiming to be the Messiah and someone who was assembling a, and developing a following, meaning that the Romans understood that a person claiming to be the Messiah is claiming to be the king of Israel. And the Romans did not take kindly to this. To them, this was a challenge to their rule. Um, they were essentially ruling Judea. They were ruling the land of Israel. And they would not put up with someone who claimed to be the Jewish Messiah, to be the Jewish king. You see in the Christian Bible itself, in the book of Acts, chapter 5, um, you know, the writer tells us about Judas the Galilee and the Egyptian who claimed to be someone, obviously, in context, they didn't claim to be Elvis Presley. They claimed to be the Messiah, and we're told that the Romans killed them. And Josephus as well speaks about other people back then who claimed to be the Messiah, and they were killed by the Romans. So I think that the most logical reason for why Jesus would want to impose some secrecy about who he was is that he knew that had word spread too quickly, the Romans would have snuffed his life out prematurely, meaning that he would never have made it to Jerusalem to be able to um, do whatever he thought would happen in Jerusalem. So um, that, that to me makes the most sense. In verse 21, so it says that when his own people, now what is it, his own people, what does that mean? So most of the commentaries say that his own people is referring to his family. So it says in verse 21, when his own people heard of this, meaning that it doesn't really seem to tell you what they heard about, but it seems that they were reacting to the fact that he had a following and people were coming to him to be healed. So in verse 21, when his own people heard of this, they went out to take custody of him. They went out to take custody of him, for they were saying he has lost his senses. So his family basically is saying 
you know, we've got to, you know, sort of uh, take control of Jesus. He seems to be out of his mind. You know, he's teaching, he's preaching, he's having people gather around him. What's going on? Now, we see this is repeated many times in the Christian Bible, um, where basically Jesus is even saying that, you know, if you remember Rodney Dangerfield, the comedian, I get no respect, he basically was realizing that he didn't get any respect from his family. He says in Mark chapter 6, we'll see this in a few weeks, in chapter 6, verse 4, Jesus said, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. It's very interesting, by the way, that many people assume that this is a quote from the Talmud. It's quoted in, in Hebrew as Ein Navi Be'iro. There's no prophet in his hometown. Um, but actually, it, it's, it's from here. It's from Mark chapter 6. So he's saying here that, you know, he's not really being accepted um, in his own hometown, among his own relatives, in his own household. And in John chapter 7, verse 5, it says, for not even his own brothers were believing in him. His own brothers didn't believe in him. And then we read something in Luke. I want to just read this in chapter 2 in Luke. So in chapter 2, verses 46 to 50, I'm getting to the age where I have to put the book in my eye. Um, so this is what we find. Oh, I'm reading the wrong chapter. Okay. So chapter 2, verses 46 to 50. Then this is where Jesus is a, a young boy and his parents take him to Jerusalem for the feast of Passover. And, um, you know, basically it's like <laughs> Jesus gets lost. They can't find Jesus. Um, and so in verse 46, after three days, they found him in the temple. Sitting in the midst of the teachers both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. And he said to them, Why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand the statement which, would, which, which he had made to them. So you find all of these examples where his family doesn't know what he's talking about. They think he's crazy. They don't believe in him. Here's the problem, and let's think about this. Look at the backstory. In Matthew chapter 1, what are we told? We're told that Joseph was allegedly told that Mary, his wife, told by an angel. I mean, when you get visited by an angel, that's a pretty impressive experience. So we're told in Matthew chapter 1 that Joseph was told by an angel that Mary, his wife, would be impregnated by the Holy Spirit, and her child will save his people from their sins. It's a pretty special charge you got there. And then in Matthew chapter 2, we're told that wise men came from the east to Jesus and Mary, and they fell down and they worshipped him. They worshipped Jesus in the presence of his mother Mary. And they, give, they gave gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And then we're told that they had to flee to Egypt because of baby Jesus. Now, you read these stories, the infancy narratives of Jesus, and 
you would imagine that his parents would have gotten the message that this is not a regular kid that they have uh, growing up with them. And then when we go to the Gospel of Luke, when it speaks about the infancy narratives, it's very, very interesting. So let's go to Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 35. So there we're told the following. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he saw, he said to her, this is the angel Gabriel, said to her, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. So the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. And Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God, etc. And then in chapter two of Luke. Let's first look at verses nine to 19. I'm sorry, this is going to be a little bit long, but I think it's important to get the background here. So in chapter two in Luke, verse nine, an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone upon them and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a savior who is called the Messiah the Lord, this will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing which has happened which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. And then we go on a little bit further to verse 25. And there we're told again in the second chapter of Luke, and there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. And he came in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to carry out for him the custom of the Torah, then he took him into his arms and blessed God and said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace. According to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And his father and his mother were amazed at the things which were being said about him, their son. And Simon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed and a sword will pierce even your own soul to the end that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Now, you read all these stories about the infancy of Jesus and all the things that his family was told about who he is. 
what's impossible to understand is how quickly they seem to have literally forgotten all of this. Meaning that <laughs> you have his family being told at the beginning of the Gospels that this child is going to save the Jewish people. He's going to be the Messiah. He's going to be this God, the son of God. He's going to be reigning. He's going to be, I mean, they, they, they're told everything. And then when Jesus grows up, they think he's out of his mind. They don't understand what he's talking about. Uh, they don't believe in him. It's impossible to reconcile these two parts of the story. If indeed all those things happened in the infancy of Jesus and was told to his parents, it's impossible to understand how later on his parents don't understand who he is, why he's significant. They don't treat him as special. They think he's out of his mind. They want to have him committed. Very, very, very difficult to understand these two very contradictory parts of the gospel story here. I'm going to skip over to verses 28 and 29. So here, Jesus basically, he just had an encounter with the scribes who had come down from Jerusalem and they were claiming that he himself was possessed by the devil. They call it Beelzebul. It's not really clear what the name is. Some say it's Beelzebul. Whatever it is, he's considered to be the ruler of the demons. And they're claiming that Jesus himself was possessed by Beelzebul and that he actually himself performed his miracles by the power of the demons. So in verses 23 to 27, Jesus basically confronts these people, asking them all kinds of questions to show that it's not possible that he was performing healings and miracles through the power of the demons. And in verses 28 and 29, he says, Truly I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven the sons of men and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. And the question I would ask here is, where do we see such a teaching in the Torah? Where do you see anywhere in the Torah it talking about a sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit? And then if you do, it's an unforgivable sin. Where do you see such a teaching in the Torah? And it's interesting that this past Shabbat was the Torah portion of Re'eh. And there we read Deuteronomy chapter 13, which is all about the false prophet. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1, although it's interesting in the Christian Bible, it's pushed back to chapter 12, verse 32. But in the Jewish Bible, chapter 13 begins by saying, God is saying, basically, Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it or take away from it. So here would seem to be both adding to the Torah and taking away from the Torah. Number one, it's adding a prohibition that's not found in the Torah. There's no prohibition in the Torah against blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And secondly, the passage here, Jesus seems to be saying that there's no forgiveness. Repentance won't work. That seems to be taken away from the Torah, because in the Torah, repentance seems to be uh, a universal solvent. Whenever a person sins, they are able to repent from their sins and be forgiven. Uh, I want to conclude now with the end of this chapter, the end of chapter three, which says that his mother and his brothers, this is beginning in verse 31. His mother and his brothers arrived and standing outside, they sent word to him and called him. Jesus was inside uh, the building. He had a meeting going on. It was very crowded. And apparently his mother and his brothers were not able to get in. It was so crowded. So they sent word to him and they called him. And a multitude was sitting around him. And they said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. And answering them, he said, Who are my mother and my brothers? 
And looking about on those who were sitting around him, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Very interesting story. You see, and it's not only here, you see a little bit of a sort of dissing of his family and including his mother. We know that Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 19, verse 19, it emphasizes the importance of obeying this biblical commandment of honoring your father and mother. And yet, you know, he, he, he's told that if your mother's waiting outside for you, they want to speak to you. And instead of saying, please bring her here immediately, or instead of him going out to meet with his mother, he says, no, who, who are really my mother and brothers? It's you people, because you are following me. It's interesting that he says, whoever does the will of God is my brother. Again, there's another case where he seems to be distinguishing himself from God. He doesn't say, whoever does my will is my brother and sister and mother. But this sort of lack of true respect and honor of his parent, you see, again, in the famous passage in the second chapter of John, where there is a wedding feast going on and the wine is running out, and Jesus' mother, who was there, basically points this out to him. She points out that they're running out of wine. Maybe she was thinking that he could do something, he could help out. And he says to her again in John chapter 2, verse 4, Woman, what do I have to do with you? My hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. Again, it's, it's a kind of very dismissive comment, and it does not really show much respect and honor to his mother. Now, it's very difficult. It's hard to understand these kinds of incidents. Um, why is it that there is this, uh, you know, sort of disconnect between him and his family, between him and his mother, him and his brothers? Christian apologists have all kinds of approaches to try and smooth this over. Equally possible, I think, and again, I cannot prove this, this is very speculative, could be the tension that we saw earlier in this chapter between him and his family. Here, what we know about Jesus is that he doesn't have a lot of patience for people who question him or for people who don't uncritically accept him for who he thought he was. It's fascinating. Um, normally, you know, if a person is claiming to be a prophet or claiming to be the Messiah, it would be normal for people to question them and to wonder, well, why, why should we accept this person as the Messiah? And the, you would think that the person should be able to give a, uh, you know, credible reason or at least a compelling reason. But that doesn't ever happen. You know, basically, when people don't accept Jesus, he has very little tolerance for them. He basically curses them out throughout the Gospels. And so we have this picture of his family, particularly his family, his brothers and his parents, that either don't understand what in the world he's doing, they think he's out of his mind, they don't believe in him, they question him, and... That might be the source of this lack of respect and lack of honor that he has for them. I mean, again, I'm just speculating here, but you do see this tension in the gospel stories. You see, number one, a lack of embrace. You don't see his family acting in the way that you would think they would act if indeed they were told that this baby is the Messiah and the Son of God, and is going to bring redemption to the world and is the Holy One of Israel. If they were told all of this, you would think that they would be the greatest followers of Jesus, the greatest followers. And yet you don't see any of that. You see them basically questioning him, wondering about him, thinking the worst of him, he's out of his mind, not believing in him. 
And so we see that Jesus has a history of being, in a sense, on a very short fuse when people do not accept him. And it could be that this is the maybe one of the causes of this disconnect um, between him and his family and the lack of real honor and respect um, that is not forthcoming from him to his family. Um, okay, that's really more or less what I wanted to share on chapter three. And uh, God willing. All right, all right, all right. We'll meet again in the coming days. Give me one second here. Boy, it has been... I I told you I was going to try to step away, and I stepped away long enough to grab a cup of coffee, but that was it. <laughs> I've been actively like working in chat ever since I got back. I never got a chance to go back and, and do what I planned on doing. That's okay. Here we go. So that was good uh, uh, good stuff right there. I hope everybody goes back and watches it again. There's a lot of people in chat, a lot of new new tuners uh, who are coming to the channel who've never been to the channel before in, in chat. And uh, I'm really encouraging you guys to take time and go back and watch the video after the fact. You just ignore the chat and just listen to the content because it, it really is eye-opening. And I think that you will you will agree as well. Uh, meanwhile, uh, if, like I said before, if you need to contact Rabbi Scoback, just go to jewsforjudaism.ca and just fill out the contact us form. There's a way you can contact through email there. If you need to reach me, uh, william at tanakhtalk.com. Spell it like you see it on the screen. And we will all be easy to reach that way. So I uh, hope you all have a wonderful week. Uh, I wish we could stay in chat because there's a lot of stuff we're going to go over. But you can certainly send me an email. It's on your screen. Actually, it's, it's tanaktalk.com. But you can just go to William at tanaktalk. Hey, drop the D hyphen there. Just William straight. William at tanaktalk.com. So, okay. Well, uh, Rabbi, you're awesome. We love you. And I uh, look forward to seeing you again same time, same place next week. Hashem willing. Y'all have a great week. Peace, everybody. God bless. God bless. Hello, my dear friends. Hope this message finds you well. If you like the way this channel is going and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel by going to the website, tanaktalk.com, T-A-N-A-C-H-T-A-L-K.com. Thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanak Talk. Shalom. Shaifa